Hello and welcome to Fanatic Spiritualist, the philosophy of Stellaris. This is the panel where I'm going to sit here and talk to uh, some of my favorite people on the Stellaris team about the lore, for lack of a better term, of a Stellaris. With me today, I have Daniel, Stephen, and Gemma. Uh, but rather than having me introduce you, I think it's better if you introduce yourselves. Yeah, so I'll start then. My name is Daniel Morgord. I'm the game director on Stellaris. And as a game director, what you do is you pretty much uh, you set the theme and you set the direction for the game. Um, try to figure out like what where we should be going next, pretty much. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen Romare. I'm a game designer on Stellaris. I work mostly on game systems, numbers, balance, and game mechanics. Gemma? Yep, I'm Gemma Thompson. I'm a content designer on Stellaris, uh, which means I uh, develop and implement uh, content, uh, basically, be that uh, in-game events, uh, flavor text, uh, various expressions of game mechanics. Uh, it's a pretty varied role, but basically anything you experience and play with in, in the game. Cool. Uh, let's jump straight into it. The first question I have here on my uh, cheat sheet has to do with uh, official lore, or if there's an official galaxy uh, for the for the game of Solaris, or if it's more a case of certain entities is what makes a Stellaris galaxy uh, Stellaris. Uh, Daniel, what do you have to say on this? I think I see Stellaris more of as a, a as a multiverse where there's not one specific timeline that's true for all sort of Stellaris experiences, but rather more so we focus on like these small tidbits. Like you can have a, a specific empire like the United Nations of Earth, uh, you know, exist in one timeline. So that's obviously then they have Earth as their home world, but it could be another timeline where you find uh, if you're playing aliens, you find Earth as an irradiated uh, tomb world populated by uh, giant cockroaches, right? So that sort of is what Stellaris is, at least to me. It's more of a uh, sort of a, a stage for all these different types of stories to be able to be told. And the focus is more on like each tidbit or each specific character or each uh, uh, thing like that, rather than like uh, coming up with a rigid timeline. So Stephen, it's more Thanks. bits and pieces. Actually, let's go to Gemma because you... It really won't jump in. Oh, yeah, sorry. yeah, just to build on that, uh, perhaps the closest we do get is the likes of the uh, the precursor empires, and perhaps depending on your interpretation, the uh, the, the pre generated empires as well. Um, both of which are there and have stories attached to them, uh, but the intention behind them is more to act as stepping stones towards you creating your own law as opposed to something hard set in stone, establishing a canon kind of thing. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I would say that we have bits and pieces of history that you can find in the game, but uh, the players are the ones that are really writing the story of their own galaxy. Yeah, so while Stellaris then doesn't necessarily have an official uh, galaxy, as it were, or a rigid timeline, as Daniel pointed out uh, to me like playing stellaris you still kind of like get a feel for stellaris as being stellaris it's its own like sci-fi entity thanks to all of these small small bits and pieces that then make up the whole but how do you guys make sure that that like messaging is consistent because there are you know there's so many things that are in stellaris uh and how do you make sure that that still like sounds and feels like Stellaris? It's uh, perhaps best to describe it as a kind of uh, organized chaos, um, because a simple answer tends to be that we actually don't, in the strictest sense. There isn't like a, a an authored experience. So when you're playing Stellaris, you don't go from beginning to end with a a plot where we have dictated what your story is going to be. Um, it tends to be more that we provide these little sort of puzzle pieces that are based on a similar tone and uh, will tend to sit alongside each other. But if anything does kind of rub up against other events, um, that's part of the interest of the game is to see where, how you incorporate those stories and where they can go from. 
uh, there's a lot that goes into that with all of our games, actually. Uh, like a lot of the games that we make at PDS really dive into these uh, the aspects of like emergent stories or player stories. So we we usually don't focus that much on these designer stories in a sort of a grand scale. We more focus on like these design stories that hopefully can connect with other types of tidbits and other types of uh, you know puzzle pieces or whatever you want to call it. And then it just you know happens to tell a story. Because we as humans are so good at like creating these uh, uh, sequence of events or like findings, right? Uh, all of our text does go through at least one round of reviews to make sure that they have similar tone and phrasing, and uh, so they can all flow together in that sort of way. Um, at least all of my stuff is improved by the content uh, designers looking over it. And I guess that's also kind of kind of telling in. And that, like like you said, there's a lot of things that go go into making a a story beat or uh, a a creative asset, be that a a portrait for uh, for an alien empire or anything similar. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on how this actually works? Uh, on you know in real life, when when you guys talk about collaboration between different uh, disciplines and stuff, like if if we were to create a new piece of piece of content uh if if Gemma wanted to add um something to, to to the game how would that how would that look like what's the process of of adding of adding of adding stuff we try to be as open as we can with different requests from one another um like uh we all are sort of experts in our little field so the content designers will definitely craft a better story than i can so i'd rather give them the freedom to do so and maybe provide some context for them to work around. Like say, I'm interested in this sort of a thing. Uh, likewise, we're happy to make adjustments to numbers or mechanical effect if it supports the story. And uh, they're willing to do the same. If uh, you know we, we have specific needs, then we all kind of work together towards a solution. It's also something which varies depending on the type of content being addressed. Uh, it's quite a different process when working on uh, features attached to a species pack, for example. Uh, we'll tend to collaborate more closely with uh, artists um, within the vision put, put forth by Daniel. Um, but we'll tend to be more wanting to express and put the focus on the artwork being delivered. Um, as opposed to, say, a, a larger expansion where we will work more closely with game designers like Steven to really get into the, uh, the feature and express it in the kinds of stories we think players will be able to enjoy. Um, and sort of also to as a means of exploring that feature in and of itself. So it, it can be quite back and forth. Uh, it can be more that we follow the lead. It really depends on the kind of thing being addressed. Um, it, it's flexible. Yeah. A lot of times our designs will change over time uh, based on what the content team has come up with. Like uh, Espionage has shifted quite a bit during uh, its development as a result of that. Yeah, that's a, a good example of one in which uh, espionage started very much from a game design point of view. Uh, but by exploring the stories we could tell through espionage operations and the kinds of repercussions you might feel for, say, being the victim of espionage or getting caught, that then had a lot of feedback back towards the, the core gameplay mechanics uh, to ensure that everything felt as coherent as possible, but also because that's that's a means by which we can explore the games ourselves as its creators as well is uh, ultimately following those player stories and seeing where they can lead that is super interesting because i of course was living in a world where uh, you know daniel told steven something and steven was like these are the rules make make this work Gemma." and then Gemma came back and was like yes i've i've added i've, I've written things for the numbers of course, that's not that's not the case. Uh, one of the things, as a if if you come into Stellaris as a new player, one of the first things you encounter even before you spawn spawn your galaxy, like one of the first pieces of like written content or presentation of what Stellaris is, are the the pre written factions that uh, you know Daniel mentioned uh, uh, some of them in the intro as well. Could uh, how 
did those specific empires come about? Um, well, uh, as a relatively new member of the team, I wasn't directly involved in certainly the the earlier factions like the the UNE, Commonwealth of Man. Um, I, I joined the team at uh, Lithoids. And in fact, that was one of the first tasks I worked on was to uh, write the precursor text, not precursor, uh, prescripted empire text, we refer to it as. Uh, in that case, for the Lithoids, it's the Keepers of Ave Bren. Um, and that and most of the, the prescripted empires we've got uh, follow the same pattern of often trying to express or guide the player through to a different part of the game. So in that example, that was a, uh, let's say, spiritualist pacifist, I think. Um, there were relatively few empires of those types in the list already, so that was kind of a given. Uh, but it, it can also be used to express like features that we want to highlight about that particular um, expansion or type of play. Uh, but from that point, it's basically an open, free writing exercise. It's one of the the nicer things. But it, it's all good in content design, but uh, that's one of the one areas in which we can really let our imaginations go. Um, with the restraint that, of course, as we said earlier, this is intended to be a stepping stone for you, the players, to sort of come up with your own stories based on this. But the the nice advantage of prescripted empires is that they're available for, as you say, new players, or if you simply just don't want to come up with your own story for an empire at a given time, we try to provide the uh, an interesting resource in that respect, so you can play with an established story. Yeah, I think uh, similar to what Gemma says, like a lot of um, good things that they can do with this prescripted. Uh, empires that, that it can help the player sort of guide uh, them to maybe create their own stories at some point because the reason or a reason why we have them is that we also want to showcase the new mechanics in a in a new dlc so we usually try to make it so that these prescripted empires for example if it's uh, uh, something like the megacorp expansion then obviously a prescripted em- empire that is a megacorp uh, makes a lot of sense and then we try to look at the other ones that already exist and try to make sort of new examples of, uh, you know, a story that, that could be told. Now, uh, we've, we've touched a bit on, on lore and, uh, how that is created, um, and that it is an iterative process. Um, with that said, I'm sure there's like, there are definitely, there's parts of written pieces of content that has been added to the game and then, uh, iterated on back and forth. Um, and I'm sure there's also some things that have been been written, but then were kind of, you know, didn't make it into into the game in the end, but might still uh, be part of like your your personal uh, head canon, as it were. Uh, Stephen, do you have anything like that? Oh boy, do I! So this isn't exactly stuff that didn't quite make it into the game. I guess it didn't, but. Uh, Sometimes there are these wonderful and amazing bugs that I kind of wish could be real. Uh, I have a, my absolute favorite is a very long tale that I'm going to inflict on you now because uh, I love telling this story. Uh, So back when we were working on the origins for federations, uh, one day I clicked uh, create random empire and yeah, I got one. Um, The Erebot experiment were a fairly normal machine empire introspective, over-the-air updates. They were led by Primary Link Cube, who oversaw the Erebots efficiently, and they did their things on their desert planted Veer. They were a lost colony, so they had lost contact with their original homeworld. But wait, machine intelligences, they they weren't supposed to be able to take lost colony. It's locked out for just old intelligences. Uh, uh, But the Create Random Empire button bypassed these restrictions. So hooray, I found a bug. so to gather some more information and to satisfy some of my own curiosity, I switched to Observer to go find their home. Across the galaxy in the Chiblar system, there was the world of Clank. It was a world with a dark secret and no atmosphere. It was a barren planet with no buildings on it at all because it wasn't actually a habitable world. Because, you see, the Lost Colony origin takes the habitability from the player species in order to create the home empire. But being machines, they didn't actually have one. So, barren planet. That didn't stop the originals, though. 
they formed Earbot Intersolar. They were a mega corporation. They were a media conglomerate with an indentured workforce led by Chief Executive of- Officer Affinitor, who was a fertility preacher for robots on a <laughs> barren world. But wait. So they were an authoritarian, xenophobic, pacifist megacorp, but that meant they weren't a machine intelligence. So they were a bunch of robots but didn't have the droids technology. So that turned them into a planet, a barren planet, of 34 pre-sentient pops, uh, making them an actual soulless, mindless media conglomerate. So basically, the deeper that I looked at this thing, the better it got. So, uh, Gemma, when can we actually put them in the game? Now, Gemma, as a follow-up question, how often does this happen to you? Uh, that the game designer comes comes up with something that you're like, Stephen, stop. I have the greatest <laughs> idea ever. Daily basis? <laughs> Not quite daily, but actually, no. To be fair, Stephen does have some excellent ideas in that front. But uh, when it comes to things like soulless media conglomerates, uh, uh, I would definitely bounce that back as uh, by flagging all the balance concerns you're going to have to take up, take account of <laughs> with that one. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, Stephen's uh, favorite piece of like unobtainable uh, in-game uh, lore. Uh, Gemma, do you have do you have anything that you look upon f- fondly when it comes to like story beats or content, either in the game or not yet or never will be in the game? Yeah, definitely under the category of, well, never will be, but maybe. Um, I'm fortunate in that actually nothing I've written for the game has been cut or significantly changed. So what I've done so far is in there. But the one exception is the many save files I've got from uh, whenever I'm implementing various features. So every time uh, we we start up a new feature and I'm, I've the way content design tends to work, we, we sort of focus a little bit. So with Nemesis, as an example, I was working on espionage primarily. And for each of these, as a matter of function, I create save files of uh, various kinds of empires, usually uh, one which sort of wouldn't, you wouldn't think would work well with the feature and one that really does. Uh, for Nemesis, it was one based on a pre-scripted empire, the Gox Cartel, which is a megacorp. And just by sheer dint of the fact that I'm, I'm running these empires and like force loading events to check them for bug fixing and generally debug them and make sure that the stories sit okay and that uh, things work as a player might expect... These empires have thus gone through 50 to 100 iterations of the same kind of galaxy and the same kind of events, which ends up forming a kind of canon. Um, And it's true that actually there's a... uh, One of these is featured in the Federation joint operation we had as part of the anniversary patch, uh, the fourth anniversary patch recently. The empire you uh, dig around in for the archaeological site uh, exhibition expedition rather is uh, is one of my empires that i've created for this i just became attached to them as a a kind of uh, development experiment um so yeah there, there's all this law sat in my head for how these these empires really played out and uh maybe they'll drift in every now and then but uh yeah at the moment it's entirely on my local work machine <laughs> that's where their stories reside very good. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna flip the script because I have the flip, uh, the script right here. But I am gonna ask you a, a very uh, different question, but on at least a similar topic. Now, when we launched Solaris, the base game, one of the things you could get with that, or we launched around the same time, was a Stellaris novel, uh, which in itself, as we've pointed out, like Stellaris is essentially a collection of story beats that then uh, together in different amalgamations kind of create a story for the player that they put together in their head. But if you were tasked with uh, being able to write a sci-fi novel inside Stellaris, uh, what would you like to 
What type of novel would you like to create? I think I'm going to throw this one to Daniel straight away. Uh, yeah, it's actually an interesting uh, question because I usually think about that a lot from a like, um, sort of IP or brand perspective when it comes to Stellaris. Is like how, how would you tell these kind of more designer type stories? Mm -hmm. Because as we talked about before, even though we see Stellaris as more of a multiverse, it should still be possible to like uh, select a specific period of time uh, within the IP and uh, say like this story is something that is this is a story we're going to tell. So how I usually think about it is not too different from how Asimov's Foundation series follows like different actors throughout time and how previous events sort of affected something in the future. Similar along those lines, I think I would want to tell like uh, a more a more focused uh, stars uh, story in something like um, I usually tell this example actually, so I'm, I'm going to say it again. Uh, in the first uh, first couple of uh, or in the first book, let's say, you follow like these archaeologists that are exploring these alien ruins, and you find out more about uh, the history of what's happened here. So you basically like uncover uh, a lot of the sort of past, but it's also like a lot about the characters that are uh, investigating the site. And then maybe if we book uh, move to book two, it could explain like you know, uh, then you're moving back in time, and then you're telling the story of what happened on this site. So for example, maybe there was a a, a mining colony where everyone was uh, living under very harsh conditions because of a terrible war that was going on. They needed to produce more and more minerals, but the uh, the people at the planet never really uh, got exposed to like why they were doing it. They were just told like you know you have to produce more and more, and uh, you just like see these horrible conditions. And maybe in the third book you swap uh, swap perspective to like go to the like government level. So maybe they're like embroiled in this like terrible war, uh, you know, sort of a nemesis style. Uh, um, you know, the, the sort of federation or the galactic community versus and uh, a terrible crisis that's like wiped out a lot of the galaxy. So then you learn that like the reason why uh, the, some of the people were living on these horrible conditions on the mining colony is because they just needed more minerals for the war effort. Because if they didn't get it, like everything would be lost and everyone would uh, die. So it would be interesting to sort of show like these different perspectives and to sort of uh, try to explore a little bit that like nothing is so simple and there's uh, different perspectives and there's no like right or wrong. It's just it's just more of a like, you know, getting to some, some sort of result that you want. Just things that's, ha that, that's happening. Uh, I mean, I, Stephen, Gemma, I'm terribly sorry that I started uh, with Daniel. Uh, I asked for a novel, he gave me a full chronicle. Uh, do, you, do you guys have any thoughts about uh, Stellaris novels? I mean, Stephen? It, it is tough to top that. Um, but no, I agree. Uh, I think that since our greatest strengths are in the many different stories that we can tell, uh, a variety of perspective fits us best. That said, I definitely want to read the story about Irabot Intersolar. And uh, also, I, I wouldn't mind seeing a series on the Stellaris cinematic universe you know from our trailers with the internet interconnected stories they have there Gemma, have you uh, thought anything about this you say novel i hear occupational hazard um <laughs> I, I, I suspect I, I, wish I, could, case. <laughs> I wish i could claim a, a noble design goal but honestly like um, uh, it, it'd be a writer's dream to basically churn out at least five of these things and to be honest i'd probably start with the the the, the the empires I had in save files whose stories are never yet to be told. But uh, the, the, one of my, my favorite genres to read is um, a space opera in the sort of modern style. So mm -hmm. uh, building upon the likes of Asimov, but uh, Ian M. Banks's culture in particular. And I couldn't help but feel there's an element of uh, contact and special circumstances when I was playing through the, the aforementioned Gox cartel I had. They'd started as, uh, um, I had them as a galactic union origin, so that we'd have um, a couple of empires to immediately start spying on. And the, the extent to which you can really undermine your allies 
and then face something as horrendous as the Khan uprising or, uh, of course, the galactic crisis itself. Uh, meanwhile, you've got all your tendrils and all your neighbors who you systematically sort of stripped of resources because Megacorp. Um, I can't help but think that would be an interesting novel arc to read through. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's true of any content designer on the team. We've got novel ideas bristling around in there, and it's our job is actually to make sure we don't write novels into every event chain, basically. Yeah. Uh, right. And I, like, I, f- I kind of feel the same way when I hear what Stephen and Gemma is talking about with their novels, that they kind of want to hear what some of their uh, campaigns, how they actually would look like in novel form. Because you do kind of, you know, you kind of get attached to to your your playthrough. There's always like that one, one of the early ones where you're like, oh, that was really fun because for some reason, like the story really just worked together. And I'm like, Daniel, I'm assuming that's by design in that, you know, from a player perspective, there's a cohesive story being told in a Stellaris campaign. How do you how do you achieve that with uh, the story beats that you're working with? Um, yeah, as I sort of talked a little bit about earlier, um, we focus a lot on on player stories or emergent stories uh, instead of so called like designer stories, uh, which are more in line with uh, sort of like novels. And if you look at like you know famous games like Skyrim or or Mass Effect, they are more types of designer stories, where the games we make are are like I said way more about player stories and emergent stories. So what we do then is there's a lot of things that go into to having a successful recipe for making that work. But one of them is like to have a lot of actors that act, you know, in a random sense. So if we look at like things, uh, especially CK3 is a very good example of this. It's like you have all these characters and a lot of things can happen. And uh, even though we can write events, like um, uh, you find an alien uh, you know, this uh, alien cylinder that floats by your planet and stuff like that. So even if we write a story about that in isolation, uh, if it haps- happens in in, uh, in the same sense as something else randomly happening in, in, happening in your empire, like lay, let's say you found an alien obelisk on one of your colonies at the same time as it, the uh, cylinder like floating above it, like you can form a story that those two are connected and maybe it, like it has a, like a larger meaning, but we usually don't. Uh, create that it just happens and we create the puzzle pieces that sometimes when the stars align they create really interesting stories and i think the the best example of that is the sort of the sean dark famous after action report from uh, ck2 which i recommend people googling checking out um so yeah player stories not designer stories uh, now, lastly, because we are unfortunately uh, running out of time here, which seems to be the case of, with almost all of the Stellaris segments, at some point they come to an end, which is uh, infinitely sad, you guys, but here we are. But before you go, um, in case you don't know, uh, I know these people and pretty much the whole Stellaris team, massive freaking sci-fi nerds. Uh, Stellaris is full of Easter eggs, homages to to franchises and things that are generally just you know cool stuff. Um, I, I before we go, I'd like to hear some like your favorite Easter eggs that are you know that are people might not necessarily discover instantly. Uh, Gemma, do you have do you have any any favorites? Uh, that you know of? Um, I, I'll confess it's one that I added, um, but it, it's partly because it was kind of an ambition of mine for a while, and I don't know how many people actually noticed, but with the uh, the recent Necroid species pack, um, I was responsible for writing the, uh, the voiceover script for the Necroid advisor and was able to pepper in a couple of references to Rocky Horror um, which, given the spooky theme of the the species pack, I loved doing. Uh, so that there are moments like there's a light over at our newly established colony, and just little rewrites of uh, lyrics from uh, a, f- a film and musical, which has meant a lot to myself and a lot of people, I'm sure. Um, 
but also, yeah, very fitting for the sort of campy science fiction horror sort of thing. I, I'm really happy with those. Uh, Stephen, uh, what about you? Do you have uh, Do you have anything that people haven't noticed, but you know, should have? To be honest, the players are very good at finding the things that I've yeah. uh, snuck in there as Easter eggs. Um, and I'm not the most subtle of people. So uh, there's a few like a portal reference in one of the Galcom resolu- resolutions and uh, some pretty obvious ones in the achievements. Uh, I don't think that most of those are the best. Now, similar to Steven, I think most of the things I've put into the game are also uh, uh, mostly like fairly obvious, small like nods to uh, other things that I like. The, I mean, the, I the, the favorite, one thing. Though. Go on. Sorry. Sorry, uh, I just thought uh, we do have some examples of uh, references to our own references. Though uh, one of my favourite examples that we've recently been discussing was uh, uh, the Grand Herald and the Lesser Messenger. Um, that I particularly enjoy the fact that we we're able to refer to our own uh, infamous sorts of uh, prior um, game design and content choices as well. I'm not sure what it says about a game when it reaches a point it can reference itself, but uh, that feels pretty special. I feel like one, once you've gotten to the point where you can reference as your references, uh, uh, that's where you want to be. I feel like the only thing that could possibly be better than that is referencing the references of your references. Um, and maybe we'll, maybe we'll get there someday. People will be like, I, d- I don't understand what this is doing, and we'll be really sad, and we'll sit here in like two years' time being like, people didn't get the thing, the Easter egg I put in, that's a reference to the reference of the thing we talked about two years ago. And then we can just look at people and be disappointed in them, which is my favorite thing to do. We have Emperor Jeff. Uh, we do have Emperor Jeff. Can we, before we go, uh, can, can we hear about the Emperor Jeff story from, from the inside? Because I feel like people have, have seen Jeff. A lot of fans know what Jeff is is or who they are but not perhaps not necessarily how jeff was born speaking of references into references i i don't know who's best to tell this story though but uh, i'm going to throw it to steven for the heck of it okay well one friday afternoon a uh, image appeared in slack saying meet jeff and it was the concept art, art for the uh, Necroid, eventually, who would be you know, clearly named Jeff. And uh, Slack went nuts. It was, you know, it was Friday afternoon, we were all tired, and uh, yeah, no more work got done that day because everyone was just freaking out about Jeff, posting Photoshopped things of Jeff, 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 Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. I, I mean... To just to add to that, like the only thing that's gotten more uh, interactions on the paradox internal slacks than than Jeff when it was posted is a of course our cat channel because the cat channel's amazing. Shout out to Paracats, uh, and the other this potato looks like a video game character, but I can't figure out which one. It's potato Jeff cats. That's how our interaction goes. Uh, we must have at least 15 Jeff uh, emojis in uh, <laughs> Slack now. I spent a good 45 minutes of company time making an animated uh, GIF of Jeff. So there you have it. Contributing to company morale. It was well worth it. Uh, guys, unfortunately, I think we're, we're out of uh, time. Uh, Daniel, Stephen, Gemma, thank you guys so much uh, for hanging out and talking to me about the philosophy of Stellaris and how you guys uh, create content and story beats for uh, Stellaris. I um, hope you guys had a good time and learned something uh, about what these people over here in the floating portals do uh you should stick around because there is more pdxcon remakes coming up i'm pretty sure we're going straight back to the home studio though so see you there